be his Then I've reached untold I'd rather have Jesus Than houses or lands I'd rather be led By his nail his hands Than to be Grace Kids have a song they're going to sing for us, so let's give them a hand. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
offering basket and let's get the girls a hand as they sing the offering song. Subduing kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises. Mm. Hebrews 11:31 through 34. 
By faith the harlot of Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah also, and David, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained provinces, stopped the mouths of the lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weak weakness were made strong. Wax valley in flight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Hebrews 11, 31 through 34. Anyone else have a special? Lexi, let's give her a hand. Number 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Anyone else? A song or scripture? Okay, we'll get um, Sister Faith. We'll get all the little kids to come up, and we'll have Sister Faith to lead them. So let's give them all a hand.
march of the infantry. Okay, are you all a soldier in the war? <laughs> Has some songs that we're going to sing, so let's give them a hand.
They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for joy, they shall cry aloud and be free. They shall glorify the name of the Lord, is the blood bought, the church, the redeemed. Oh, pick up your harp, oh, Zion of the Lord, let the earth ring forth.
children torn between two ways. Some still choose to mock his name. Hear his followers now as they can boldly Glorious day. 
rising again Living He loved me Dying He saved me Buried He carried My sins far away Rising He justified Freely forever One day He's coming Oh glory Before we get into our theme tonight, we're going to sing one more worship song. And if you know the words, you feel free to sing along. Let's give them a hand. was never Just as the sun went down, just. 
The theme for tonight is Don't Stumble at the Cross. And before we start tonight, later on we're gonna have to turn off all the lights and um, for about a couple minutes, so just as a heads up. Illustration. There's a story about a little girl who proudly wore a shiny cross on a chain around her neck. One day, she was approached by a man who said to her, Little girl, don't you know that chain around your... That, don't you know that cross Jesus died on wasn't beautiful like the one you're wearing? It was an ugly wooden thing. To which the girl replied, Yes, I know. But they told me in Sunday school that whatever Jesus touches, he changes. That is part of the message of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And in verses 22 through 25, Paul continues, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews uh, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Illustration. So just to show you a little into the minds of today's Christians, so-called, listen to this. There was a lady who was interviewing people who have been caught in the act of adultery, and she wanted to get their comments on how they felt about it. One lady responded very positively, saying that her affair with a married man had been a long-standing affair, and she was very happy in it. Then someone raised the question of morality. Instantly, the woman took offense. Wait a minute, she said. I'm a Christian, but I want everyone to know that my personal life and my religion don't interfere with one another. Then she went on to say, I believe in a God who wants me to be happy, and if this man makes me happy, then God approves of the relationship. That's an amazing belief, and I wonder where she found it, because it's not in the Bible. But that kind of thinking is not new at all. It's been around for a long time. People have always wanted a God who will place his stamp of approval on their lifestyle, never requiring any change for the better. And they have come up with all kinds of euphemisms to make it sound all right. So what used to be called living in sin is now called a committed relationship. What used to be called abstinence is now called a neurotic inhibition. And what used to be called killing the unborn is now called pro-choice. Jesus encountered that attitude in his day. He looked at the Pharisees and Sadducees and called them hypocrites and whited sep sepulchers. On the outside, they appeared to be pious and prayerful and obedient to God. But inside, they were rotten. There are people like that today. The lady in the interview was just an example. There are far too many who want a God who doesn't require any changes in us and who places his stamp of approval on whatever way we want to live. But sooner or later, we bump into an old rugged cross. There we meet a God who says, I don't like your sin. It is so horrible that it requires me to go to the cross and suffer and die to free you from the punishment you deserve. Then Paul declares, the Jews stumble over the cross. They are stumbling blocks. And the Greeks think it is foolishness, but others see in it the power and wisdom of God. And there are still those three kinds of people in the world today. Number one, the Jews. The Jews stumbled over it because Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah they wanted. That's strange because the Jews had been carefully picked by God. He had watched over them and protected them down through the generations and had prepared them to be the nation through whom the Messiah would come. But when he came, they crucified him. The Bible says that Jesus came unto, came unto his own and his own received him not, John 1 11. Why? Why didn't they receive him? Because the, Jews demand, because the Jews demand miraculous signs. They were expecting a Messiah who would perform miracles on their behalf. Now the amazing thing is that was what Jesus, Jesus was doing exactly that. He was performing miracles, giving sight to the blind, straightening the legs of the lame, cleansing the lepers. He was ministering them, reaching out to meet their needs. But those weren't the kinds of miracles they wanted. They wanted signs of power and success. They wanted a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and reestablish the kingdom of David. If he, had, if he had marshaled an army and led them into battle and defeated the Romans, if he would have showed them that he was successful and victorious, they would have marched behind him. But the cross got in the way. 
You see, dying on the cross doesn't look like success or power. It doesn't look like victory. It looks like weakness. It looks like failure. It looks like defeat. So they kept stumbling over it. It kept getting in the way. Not only did they have a false concept of the Messiah, they also had a false concept of salvation. They thought the way to salvation was through their own righteousness. So they were busy keeping a law, but they weren't keeping God's law. They were just going through the motions, going to the synagogue at the appointed times, saying their prayers loudly so that all could hear, and giving their offerings in such a way that everybody was impressed with their generosity. They appeared to be pious and prayerful and generous, and I'm afraid that there are people just like that in our world today. So in their minds, they didn't need a savior. They didn't need anybody to die on the cross for them. They thought the way to salvation was through their own righteousness, which they carefully defined to their own liking. As a result, they kept stumbling over the cross. The Greeks. Then Paul looked at the Greeks. Verse 22 says that the Greeks look for wisdom. They were the intellects of the day. They produced men like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Great thinkers. Many of them we still read even today. Socrates said, The secret to a successful society is education. If we can just give everybody a good education, then it must follow that the world will get better and better. Now that sounds familiar. We've been told that for generations. Education will solve all our problems. All we need is more education, and mankind will become better and better. But we haven't, haven't we? I'm certainly not opposed to education, but it's just that we learn, we can learn everything there is to learn and still have a fatal flaw, and that fatal flaw is sin. The 17th chapter of Acts describes a scene when Paul came to Athens. The Athenian philosophers met on Mars Hill, the Oropagus, and they sat there all day thinking their profound thoughts. And Luke says that they spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Then one day, the Apostle Paul went up on Mars Hill and started telling them about a God who was unknown to them. This God came to earth, walked among men, died on the cross, and rose again. But it was all foolish, foolishness to them. There are people who think like that today, too. Reason tells you that babies aren't born to virgin girls. Reason tells you that God doesn't become flesh. Reason tells you that Almighty God will not allow puny men to nail Him to a cross. Reason tells you that when a man dies, he cannot be resurrected back to life again. None of that makes any sense. So the Greeks looked at the cross as foolishness. They also had a different concept of salvation. The Greeks believed that all souls are mortal. Therefore, when you die, you automatically go to be with the gods, if your life was good enough. Then you stay with the gods. But if it wasn't, then you were reincarnated into another body, and you got a chance. And he kept trying until he got it right. That way, everybody's finally saved. Nobody's lost. You just keep being reincarnated until finally everybody's with the gods. They didn't need a savior because in their thinking, everyone was going to be saved. So when it came to hearing about a cross, that was foolishness. Why does anybody have to go to a cross and die? We're all going to be saved anyway. Doesn't that sound familiar? We're hearing some of that same kind of thinking today. It's not new. It's as old as Mars Hill. Number three, what about today? Man hasn't learned anything new. We're still committing the same sins, still think thinking the same false thoughts, still stumbling over the same cross. We're still laughing at the wisdom of God and treating it as foolishness. Illustration, Michael Bird, a minister of, in Australia, tells us about a well-known American preacher who gave some advice to an Australian congregation. He said, don't tell people about the cross. It doesn't work. That's why the Franklin Graham Crusades are no longer effective. Just tell them that God loves them and has a plan for them. The cro crooks, uh, uh, his advice was that the message of a crucified Jew is ridiculous to the modern mind. So move on to something better. A crucified Messiah is stupid. But promise them prosperity. Give them emotional experiences. Provide them with self-esteem. Then you'll fill the pews. 
But brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. The Christ who miraculous, miraculously confronted Saul, the persecutor of Christians, on the road to Damascus is the same Christ who confronts us today with the unchanging message of the cross. And I'm convinced that sometimes he still confronts non-believers in ways that may be hard for us to understand. But God is not limited by our unbelief. Even as Jesus miraculously confronted Saul, who sincerely thought that he was carrying out God's purpose in hunting down, arresting, and even killing Christians, I think he is perfectly capable of confronting people today. <clears throat> Illustration. I want to tell you of a modern-day Damascus Road experience that some of you may find hard to believe. It is reported in an article by Fred Market in an issue of Prey Magazine. Fred is the international director of YM, YWAM's Strategic Frontiers, a group that focuses on witnessing for Christ among mostly Muslim nations where it's not always easy for Christians to go. Fred is living in Afghanistan, and he relates a story about a Muslim woman, a university professor, attending an English class taught by YWAM volunteers. Listen as she later tells her story to one of them. I started to go to sleep, and suddenly my bedroom filled with light. At the foot of my bed stood Jesus, and I knew he came to kill me. You see, the day before, she had stormed out of the English class after the teacher had begun to answer questions and to speak about Jesus to his students. As she stormed out, she cursed the teacher. I curse you all the way home, she told him. I went home, and I laid in bed, and I was praying. Allah, I want you to kill those people because they're not English teachers. They are missionaries, and I want them out of my country. Kill them. It was then that she saw the vision of Jesus standing at the foot of her bed, and I knew he had come to kill me because I was asking Allah to kill his workers. So I got out of bed on my hands and knees. I was trembling, and I crawled to the feet of Jesus, waiting for him to slay me. As I was trembling at his feet, I started to feel warm all over. I started to feel love wash over my body, love and mercy. I looked up at him, she said. Jesus was so beautiful, I had to give him my heart. Today, that woman, a university professor, is a Christian who earnestly tells her students that Jesus is real and that he is her savior and Lord. And amazingly, from all throughout the Muslim world, there are similar accounts coming to the surface. I wish I had time to tell, you the, tell, tell more of them to you tonight. But now I ask you, are these stories hard, hard for you to believe? Maybe so. In the Bible, in every instance of God used supernatural events, it was always to advance his kingdom on earth. There was always a practical application to a real world situation. Think about the angel appearing, appearing to Cornelius the, the centurion, telling him to send for Peter, who would tell him the words of life. Or about the angel appearing to Philip and telling him to go down the road where he would meet the Ethiopian eunuch. And how about Paul's vision of a man begging him to come over to Macedonia and help us? We can't let him go on like this. He'll destroy everything we work for. Whether this man is a sinner or not, I do not know. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Why didn't you obey your orders and arrest him? Because no one has ever spoken the way this man does. What crimes do you condemn this man for? He's a blasphemer and a, cruci and a criminal. Crucify him. Why, what evil has this man done? Crucify him. Give the people what they want. 
A crown of thorns for the king of the Jews. <laughs> Stretch him out. How can he save others when he can't even save himself? Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. God, please don't take my son. Please. He's dead. Take him down. Let us have his body, please. He deserves a proper burial. He wasn't the savior we thought he was. What now? It's over. Sin had destroyed us, left us for dead, stole our hope, and separated us from God. We were lost. We were broken. We were empty. We were alone. But God loved us and gave his only son to pay our price and restore our hope. Sin has been conquered. Death has been defeated. The grave is empty. He is not here. Hope, hope has, has risen. risen. It's not about the manger where the baby lay It's not about the angels who sing for him that day It's not just about the shepherds or the bright and shining star It's not all about the wise men who travel from afar It's about the Christ It's about my sin It's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday It's about the cross It's not all about the good things in this life of time It's not all about the treasures or the trophies that I've won It's not all about the righteousness that I find within It's all about His precious blood that saved me from my sin It's about the cross It's about my sin It's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday It's about the cross The beginning of a story Is wonderful and great It's the ending that can save you And it's why we celebrate it's about the cross, it's about my sin It's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again It's about God's love nailed to a tree It's about every drop of blood that flowed from Him when it should have been me It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I can have real life someday. So that you and I can have real life someday. It's about the cross. It's about the cross. In conclusion, there may be a lot of things that we don't understand, but remember, God accomplished that which was impossible when he went to the cross and died for our sins. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I can't explain it to you, but I know that it is true, and that this is, and that this is the invitation we offer. An invitation to stand by the cross to see the one who suffers and dies there, to submit to the one who says, I don't like your sin, but I stand ready for, to forgive you, 
and to prove that I'm sincere. I'll pay the price if you'll accept it. I'll grant you my pardon if I'll grant you my pardon. I'll forgive you and love you for all eternity. Let's stand together tonight and join us in Lord I need you. Oh, 